welcome to another episode of Money for Nothing, the podcast about music and capitalism. I'm Saxon Barrett with Sam Backer as always. Today we'll be checking in on the state of Spotify. And then I guess we're examining some rumblings coming out of the majors. And we're going to do uh, some like loose uh, attempts at trying to connect the dots with it all. But to like dive right in, Sam, um, I guess like a number of things have been happening at the streaming giant Spotify since we last checked in. Um, most notably is that they laid off 6% of their staff, which uh, considering inflation and Spotify's inability to turn a profit, uh, I guess isn't much of a surprise to probably anyone. But there's also a bunch of other reasons for this. I, if then Correct me if I'm wrong, but the layoffs also occurred around the same time that a major executive, uh, Don Ostoff, departed from her position at Spotify, which is only notable for this episode, I think, because she was really behind Spotify's Spotify's push into podcasting, which saw them signing exclusive deals. With... Means we're never going to get those sweet, sweet podcasting Spotify bucks. Dude. I know. That I was know. our shot. I'm so disappointed. The, the, the window closed. I know. I know. I, I was hoping that, the, you know, after they signed exclusive deals with podcast heavyweights like Joe Rogan and Call Her Daddy, um, that they would turn their attention to more um, uh, niche markets, like the one of uh, the people who listen to Money for you. Nothing. You. Yeah, me. Of, yeah, you, dear listener. Yes, you, dear listener. Yes. <laughs> no, not oh, you. Oh, me? Oh, them. not me. Oh, you, dear listener. Right. Yeah. No, not you. Not you, them. Who's on first? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But as it turns out, there were no sweet bucks. Surprise, there's no money in podcasting, really. And I kind of feel like I knew that all along. But anyways, um, <laughs> or at least... Uh, there's not enough money to warrant multi-million dollar deals, but the uh, bigger picture here is that, um, and is that uh, the push into podcasting was really an attempt to kind of come out from under the labels, right? And being a purely music, and also uh, to kind of stop being a purely music streaming service. But it turns out it's probably just one of Spotify's many flailing moves that they've uh, attempted over the past half decade in an attempt to turn a profit. I don't know, Saxon. Um, because it sounds to me like they have a plan. And as CEO Daniel X says, in their brand manifesto, capital B, capital M, change is the only constant. For this reason, I continue to reiterate that speed is the most defensible strategy a business can have. But speed alone is not enough. We must also operate with efficiency. It's these things together that will fuel our long-term success. And while we have made while we have made great progress in improving speed in the last few years, we haven't focused as much on improving efficiency. <laughs> Ooh, so thank you for your hard work so, and uh, enjoy Monday morning in front of your laptop uh, reloading the Department of Labor site as you try to sign up for unemployment. Dude, also just like <laughs> I, I thought when I read that for the first time, I legit thought it was a hoax. I'm like, they're being like, <clears throat> we believe in speed and efficiency. And while we are faster than ever. <laughs> yeah, just such like, like what, hogwash. What? It's un. It's, yeah, like what is it's, this? Like, like. I don't I like it's yeah it's un it's like it it's if you were a NASCAR team like, like maybe may even then maybe it's like it's like a no. uh Talladega Nights level or, business plan or it's like it's like a computer app for Apple from like 1985 or something like that's what I was like going to reference like it's like what like <laughs> it's like we will focus more on optimizing our efficiency transfers as we motivate our co-locational employees to quant requantify their speed <laughs> I am, I'm personally, let me tell you, as the closer I get to 40, I am constantly requantifying my speed. <laughs> yeah. So as you can see with that, they are struggling. Yeah. They're focusing on efficiency, AKA trimming a significant proportion of their employee base. And, you know, like tr truly sorry for everyone who, who gets laid off from any position. Um, but I mean, these layoffs are happening across across tech right now. As companies that went, it's also like this very specific thing where not only are they're, they're all shedding employees right now, but also like it's very difficult to overstate how much they beefed up over the pandemic when everyone's like, ah, everything's digital forever and no one will ever be in person for anything again. And like, obviously, as we all know, 
many things are still digital, but at the same token, like some things have returned to, to more towards the, the, the baseline, right? Like we're not all in our house all the time, like <laughs> binging on white wine and just streaming Spotify constantly. We can like <laughs> go, <laughs> maybe I'm just talking about my pandemic, but like <laughs> yeah, we um, can go outside <laughs> and like see other people and do other things. Um, and so like a lot of tech companies that went, really really increased the the volume of their workforce have have like cut it back dramatically and i actually don't know offhand whether spot this brings spotify back down to where they were prior to the pandemic but definitely it's like a a blow to the kind of sense that it is possible to always be growing a sense that it's possible to like like this this sky's the limit mentality of like oh we'll hit profitability sometime somewhere in some beautiful land um and like and just a sense that you know as we've talked about a couple times that that in a in a dramatically different macroeconomic environment um like a different set of like business mechanics are at play now and spotify is focusing (laughs) while maintaining their focus on speed is is attempting to, to figure out ways to make like money which as you said, has actually been their focus in various avenues for for a while. Yeah, and what I was gonna say is that you were talking, you were asking like, you know, if it brings them back to like pre-pandemic uh, levels or whatever. And I'm I'm not sure about that, but I mean, I think one consistent thing that has occurred um, even through the pandemic and before and also after is that they continue to lose money, and that is certainly the case behind a lot of uh, these layoffs. Spotify's value has significantly decreased in the last year uh, while their spending has gone up. And some of the numbers go to show that uh, Spotify's quarter three, 2022, uh, the company spent 75.3% of its uh, 3.04 billion euro revenue. And like that, and, and, the, and the wild thing is, is that like a nearly a quarter of that was a cost was, uh, was went to uh, royalty payments to labels and publishers, but also like, yeah, Spotify also spent like an all-time high, like nine hundred seventy-eight million on operating costs, like at that same quarter. And also, they've watched their stock completely plummet. Um, uh, currently, Spotify is only worth about fifteen billion at the New York Stock Exchange, uh, which uh, apparently at one point it was like on level with uh, UMG, and yet yeah, now it's like a like a, like a, like a quarter of like what UMG is worth. So like, yeah, it's it's like it's never it's never operated like um in the green, but it's like uh, only gotten worse uh since the pandemic as you mentioned and uh yeah the numbers are like huge and like i mean (laughs) they don't look good that's for sure and actually yeah uh music business worldwide which we uh which we both love shout out to the good work that people do there um apparently uh in one of the articles a u.s executive uh texted a music business worldwide uh with quote how the fuck is supposed to spot Asking how the fuck is Spotify supposed to grow their value when the major labels take all their profit, which is also an interesting topic that uh, I think we'll probably be touching on more later. You know, it's weird. It's like it's like watching someone you dislike have tuberculosis. It's like you're not rooting for the tuberculosis, but you're also like don't love them. So <laughs> with this kind of a grim kind of check-in it's also like worth noting and and, you know this is a story we've been following for a while um just like yeah trying to think through spotify's position its position within the broader music industry um and what it's been trying to do in order to kind of get out of 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 the tight spot that um that you mentioned which is basically because of um the deals is cut with the major labels around rights and 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 payouts it's stuck paying out an enormous amount of the money it brings in to these uh ip holders and that that fundamentally is you know you know the, the central challenge um central challenge of the business now i actually think though it's important to note that there's kind of two two dynamics at play here right one is spotify vis-a-vis the major labels and this is you know this image that we we've used a lot when we're when we're talking about them is is kind of like the idea that they're like handcuffed together and in my mind it's almost like one of those like handcuffed together scenes in like a jackie chan movie right like they don't like each other 
but they're they're stuck yeah, together totally. and they're you know gonna go on like a wild adventure through um hong kong because i guess i'm thinking of rush hour did that happen in rush hour i feel i feel like it did was it like san francisco or something i don't know uh, oh i guess it was listen we don't we don't we don't do a like uh, we don't do a, like a niche movie podcast all right so yo like, po- don't rush hour us, okay? was not a niche movie <laughs> rush hour was an international hit my guy <laughs> <laughs> sorry i'm sorry googling googling uh box office profits of rush hour as we speak um continue chris tucker is an icon <laughs> but right so these two dynamics one is which is this like goofy corporate buddy comedy with the major labels and the other is spotify's position vis-a-vis the other major music streaming services um, and, of course, there's, like, a couple of smaller ones. There's, you know, the Deezers and or Titles of the World, which, I mean, Titles, you know, got uh, bought by, by a much larger company now, but is still, like, significantly smaller. Um, you know, obviously, there's a lot of kind of, like, local music streaming services across the globe. But in the U.S. and, and uh, I think, to a certain extent, European markets – there's Spotify, which is right like an independent company, or rather like a standalone company that just does this. And then there are, like, I would say like tentacles from the tech giants. You've got YouTube Music from Google, you've got Apple Music from Apple, you've got Amazon Music from Amazon, and and all three of those are tied to tech mega mega corporations obviously which means that they while i mean those companies are also laying off large numbers of workers and um struggling through this environment where like things have to make a certain amount of profit but given how much cash apple has if they wanted to just drop the price of apple music to next to nothing right like i mean like they might get dinged by by some like uh uh regulate regulators or they might run into problems with it but like my sense of their just like cash reserves um at least last time i checked is like they could afford to do that for a while right like you could have an existential threat at any moment to spotify's continued existence and continued existence because as we know ad based revenue models for streaming services really just haven't worked and um fr- friend of the pod david turner uh told me this uh explained this like at great length to me recently and just yeah and, and you can look at the records like spotify makes the vast majority of its money not from selling advertisements to free tier listeners but from having the advertisements be so annoying that people are willing to spend 10 bucks a month for the paid subscription. And so like uh, only about 14% of Spotify's revenue comes from advertising sales. So the vast majority of it comes from subscriber sales, right? Uh, or su- subscriptions. And and so what, what it seems like to me that means, right, is that given the fact that what these various services offer is essentially the same. And we've said this before, like the kind of differentiation between Hulu and Netflix, for example, that makes folks maintain a subscription to both of them simply doesn't exist. And and I would actually argue like really can't exist in streaming services because so much of the utility of these services is the ability to like juxtapose wildly different kinds of music right like i think that if i had to like go to one streaming service for one kind of thing music and one a different streaming service for another one it would because i we consume music in in far smaller chunks than we consume like television shows i think it'd be really and not to mention the importance of playlisting like i think it'd be like intensely disruptive all of which is to say that in many if not most ways What Spotify is offering is identical to what Apple Music or YouTube Music is offering, which means that they are not only trying to make a profit, 
and make a profit vis-a-vis -vis the major labels that are sucking up most of their income. But they're also trying, I think, to desperately differentiate themselves from something like Apple Music so that if and when one of their competitors does something like crazy, like make their service free, they don't just literally dry up and blow away as people look at, at their you know, credit card statements and say like, Apple Music is only $2 a month. Why wouldn't I use that instead of spending $10 for Spotify? Spotify doesn't give me $8 a month more value. And so I think that one of the things we're trying to do with a whole set of kind of interesting maneuvers, uh, the push into podcasts being probably first among them, um, is differentiate themselves and say, well, maybe it's worth $8 a month for you to be able to listen to Joe Rogan, for example. Because the question is, then why doesn't Joe Rogan just go off on his own, like on Patreon or something? I mean, he might, because they paid him, they paid him a ton of money. Right. And they just have to fucking deal with <laughs> and it, right? his contract is up, his contract is up for renewal. So we'll see. He like very well might pull a, uh, like a Howard Stern and just go off on his own, you know? Or rather, I mean, Stern went to Sirius Radio, but yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Decide to get a higher payout with a smaller market rather than try for the you know a mass market, but through someone else. Right, and like and also as I understand, like you know, Spotify was actually what they're trying to do is they're trying to like generate money. So the idea was to turn in, turn towards podcasting, grow that part of Spotify, the podcast part, and then make money Which off the have. advertising revenue generated from like you know, distributing, like, I don't know, 100,000 podcasts or some shit like that. Yeah, and, and it's important to note that for Spotify podcasts, even as a premium subscriber, you still have to go through advertising. Um, you can right. click through it, but, you know, there, like, is some on there. You know, there's an obvious, like, solution to Spotify's problems, which is that Spotify's price has been static for like a decade <laughs> and that was even you know a decade where with even with minimal inflation but now that there's serious inflation like you could and that has broken the bounds on all kinds of price you know price stability um you could you could raise the price and then you just like presto changeo make more money I mean, maybe. I mean, like majority of that probably would still go to the to the music business. But yeah, it is interesting your point because you know you you were saying like, you know, uh, how much it would like impact Spotify if like Apple Music was suddenly to go free or to like be like a dollar or whatever. But actually, like Apple Music and also Amazon Music have also raised their subscription prices because of this inflation. Yeah, and and that's a really think I think that's one of the most important things that has happened in the streaming economy for a long time right like apple music kind of breaking <laughs> breaking the decision and, and moving and bumping their price by like two dollars or something which is like seemingly not that much but that's like that's a 20 percent increase right that's a now multiply that over the entire streaming economy if they all did it and that would mean there was 20 percent more music Minus increased overhead, blah, 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 minus taxes, blah, 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 but like 20% more money coming in. And of course, you'd lose some subscribers, but like, so it wouldn't actually add up to 20. But let's just say for the sake of argument, it's a significant percentage more money just suddenly within the broader music economy. And it, like, you know, there's there's a significant you know, there's a significant amount of pressure on them, not just uh, from coverage offered by something like Apple Music, but also pressure from the kind of artist groups that we've talked about before, uh, the folks behind the Justice at Spotify campaign that have been lobbying Spotify to raise their prices. Because if you want a more equitable split out to artists, starting, <laughs> starting by just increasing the pie so that everyone can make some more money so this entire sector can make some more money is like a decent place a decent place to start and so like i think your question a little bit saxon is like why didn't spotify raise the prices right because it's like the only advantage they have against the other the other streaming services <laughs> if those streaming services do just 
as they did decide to raise, raise their prices yeah i think that's exactly right i think right and and which just kind of goes to show this funny funny situation in this part of the music industry where even like even <laughs> even as something like apple music raises its prices um the very fact of its existence the fact of these different competing platforms all with essentially equivalent offerings depresses prices as a whole right and prevents them from doing what you know other companies that are struggling towards profitability can do uber raises its prices i mean that happens for a lot of complicated reasons uh including like but yeah uber raises prices because public transportation has been completely annihilated and so therefore like people still have to use it and, and they're not affected yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. well i mean they, <laughs> and they have and then there's a whole base of people who have like can't get a can't get a decent job in like wherever they're living and so they're uber drivers and then they get less profit but they're kind of like tied to it no totally totally and and, and also like there's there's uh legislation in cities and all, all kinds of other things so it's not a perfect comparison but the point is is that uber and lyft because there's only two of them and that offer essentially equivalent services with enough reach can like raise their prices and have you know kind of trap the consumers who still want to take a cab even if they maybe they take it less often there isn't another one whereas if there were five streaming services in new york you know cab services in new york city and one of them was cheaper even if there was one of them that was cheaper it would prevent the other ones from raising their prices because like i i mean when i take a cab i don't do it that often but like when i take a cab i do the standard thing which is i check both right i've got no brand loyalty between uber and lyft i check both and i go with whichever one is cheaper at that moment and i feel like a similar thing is like happening with these um with these streaming services and so you do get this funny sectoral thing happening which is in some ways because of the setup of these companies and because of the ways in which they're situated on the um the like build a huge market share stock market based tech model right to like get the products into the maximum hands of consumers that they you get this funny thing where as the sector as a whole in order for musicians to make more money in order for these companies to make more money you get this funny like musicians versus consumers tension and the consumers sure like we can all say to we're blue in the face like you should want to pay more for the same thing because it's morally good but like i don't i struggle to see how in a commodity society that argument is gonna is gonna like function on a mass scale it seems like goods are more expensive when there's a clear differentiation or when they when you can come up with some other reason to make them more expensive or when <laughs> you can sometimes in some ways like really make the moral case but even then like it's like fair trade coffee is better for the world and it's better coffee is the idea so i mean in some ways given all of that like inflation is kind of a really unique opportunity it seems like because everyone's currently used to paying more money for everything right it broke the kind of set of inflation broke the set of societal agreements about price stability and people are like sorting through how much they're willing to pay for various things in this in a very painful way but it also means that it feels like because everyone's got sticker shock all the time right now, you could make a claim that like, fuck it, music's worth 15 bucks a month. It is. It's worth 20 bucks a month. It just, it like, it is. And I feel like $2, but like, if you could double the amount of music money flowing into this music economy, I think that you could like, you'd lose a lot of people. A lot of people would go to freemium. A lot of people would keep it. Um, people are already making in a decision making mode between like their various like what they want to keep but like yeah sure like decide whether you want hbo max or spotify i'm willing to like <laughs> ask people to make that choice i know like i mean spotify is the only one i really pay for so <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> be a bad, well, you know, you know, i'm a bad example but like 
you could you could remonetize this you could remonetize this space like you could say that like music and maybe maybe this is like entirely foolish but it does seem like this is a moment where you could say like music is valuable and it's worth it's worth valuing it <laughs> with money and the thing is that it's been used as a loss leader for way too long by not by Spotify, but you know, even by Spotify, <laughs> we're using music to become an audio company. And and like, if music's a loss leader, the artists suffer. Yeah, but there's an interesting aspect to this though that I think maybe also to bring just to like make the conversation a little bit more complex is that it's like to the advantage sure. of you know using the so using the Uber, Lyft like I uh, example, it, it's actually kind of to their their uh -huh. advantage to not really compete with each other because it's kind of like a two-headed monopoly at this point and so like yeah like there's like there is like quote-unquote competition but there isn't like but it's actually like to like not do something crazy like suddenly slash their prices or offer you free uh like a m one month free uh subscription to like twitch if you for every like lift ride you take like or some crazy shit like that like it, it wouldn't like it's actually gonna it's, it's not to the advantage to undercut that because then you can bring because if you undercut the other company and that that company really starts to hurt then you're kind of leaving an open space for like a third or a fourth competitor to come in uh -huh. and like i feel like that in a way kind of also like reflects like the three-headed monster that is the music industry at this point or the music the, the majors essentially and then we can probably carry that over to a certain extent where we're like you just made the example that like amazon and apple while like different companies as you said like like the music streaming part of it is just like one tentacle of many while for spotify it's like in a way they're they're actually the competitor the like quote unquote like disruptor like in that space so there's like there's like no advantage to like that i can see to like apple or amazon like working with spotify like it doesn't seem to like help them in any way right so it's like i don't know so i don't like yeah, yeah so, so, so so i'm just trying i'm just trying to like think this think the think through this out loud but it just seems like like spotify it also showcases that spotify doesn't really get like or any kind of i don't want to say support but like friendly competition from like any of these services like these services including the major labels would probably love to see spotify fold and not be around anymore i mean is that do you think that that's i think that that's right right like that that i mean it just kind of like goes to sh show like how weird a position like apple music or amazon music is yeah completely like youtube music seems like it's more it's kind of different because youtube music is about in some ways um it seems like it is a addition and and folks if you are a youtube music <laughs> power user or someone in the company like please uh please shoot us an email we'd love to chat but my sense is that youtube music is more about kind of um spinning off spinning out of the importance of like make given how important music is for youtube full stop right like youtube music is part of the making everything good with the major labels yeah. to like maintain that relationship and certainly, like uh, like Lear Cohen, who's like an old school, it was old school major label guy. Like, it, it one of his jobs is to like make things good with the major labels. But the other two are like, as you're saying, like they're kind of weird companies, right? Like Amazon Music seems like it's one of the things that Amazon does in that weird Amazon way, right? Where they like spin out everything, and some of them make money, and some of them are Alexa, <laughs> and uh, Apple Music feels to me at this point like a hangover from the fact that apple's corporate resurgence was based in many ways on based on, on the, the ipod, iPod. <laughs> and like they, like that's not how and and the iphone and music was a crucial part of both of those things and like i don't you know i don't think that you know as many iPod sales as there were, and there were a lot, like compared to MacBooks, I don't think it's even close to how much, you know, you can compare how much money they made on them. But like that was a crucial, if not the crucial part of Apple's um, music as a loss leader was the crucial part of Apple's like return to the corporate, not just corporate profitability, like out of the wilderness, but like become one of the dominant companies of our time. And so it seems to me like, 
Apple Music as a subscription service is kind of like a a, a, a funny hangover from that. Like they're not gonna, they don't seem like they're getting rid of it, but like they don't it doesn't it's not like mission essential and i assume i assume like they're not like losing a ton of money from it either um but yeah so the, so those two ones mean you're right like there's this weird like they <laughs> they would love it if this space became intensely profitable there's no reason to get out of it cuz they don't have that much skin in the game at some level right 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 um and like you're saying, but, and they're not, but and, and there's no reason to like cooperate with like anything that Spotify wants because it's like it doesn't it, it doesn't reinforce the sort of duopoly. It, it doesn't reinforce any sort of like yeah duopoly like triopoly if that's even a word I don't know. But yeah, it doesn't really really enforce that. So it's kind of like we'll just watch you like wither on the vine and like we'll gladly fill that space and be be ready for it actually at four dollars more. <laughs> but I actually but actually I want to go back to a point that you actually were kind of mentioning about like the sort of complexity of YouTube, which is actually kind of the model that Spotify is trying, I think, to I don't know if model's the right word, but like kind of the direction of Spot I think that we're seeing Spotify try to head towards even when it comes to podcasts where Do you remember when Spotify did video for two weeks? I don't remember that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, they have those like weird reels for the really? songs. It was they were pivoting. They briefly pivoted to video. Well, well, like, well, well. Like, hey, hang, hang twenty thirteen. Hang tight because it might be coming back. Uh, but um, what I, what I was just gonna say is that like you know like audio is natural as you said kind of nat- like is oftentimes like a major aspect of YouTube and then obviously like suddenly it became like problems when it comes to like copyright and everything but like with the point is is that it's like what do we call it like industry adjacent in a sense like I mean, you could say you can make an argument like music uh-huh. is industry adjacent to video i don't know if that that sounds funny but it is yeah and that's and that's yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of spotify why when they rebranded themselves as like an audio platform it was like well like podcast is like industry adjacent to like music right and that's what they keep trying to do now 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 i want to go back to that other point that you made about them switching to video whoa holy shit okay guess what headline this is going to change spotify are you ready for this no spotify will launch a tiktok-esque vertically swiped feed holy shit people this is groundbreaking are you kidding me <laughs> oh god man just like a fish out of water flopping around uh, you know what the worst part is saxon <laughs> You know what the worst part is? I think it might even work. What's the worst part? Because <laughs> I, 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 they do I this think, thing. No, they've I, been I doing did, this okay. thing in updates, right? Where, where, um, because in some ways that's another value add, right? In, in in many ways, like the biggest value add that they have so far is one is the playlist ecosystem, right? They 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 really have incredibly limited and not particularly effective social aspects. I mean, I remember when you used to would like message folks across Spotify and they like <laughs> took that away, but playlisting is a a major part of this. And and people really do like the the kind of um uh, uh personalized suggestion stuff which they are amping up with this like they just added an AI DJ with like a voice generated thing that like like uh sorry a voice generated ai voice generated like patter of this guy like explaining the music as he like cuts between songs it's like weird weird like blade runner radio (laughs) um as like as like one thing but but generally generally i think that just just listen to nts yeah (laughs) just Please, it's it's real people. They there's enough there's there's great there's real people pitter pattering between songs about random facts. Like it's great. Dub, just just yeah. listen to NTS. <laughs> um or you know, like college radio. <laughs> the 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 thing though, though is like that is a real value add and people really do like that. And and they've been pushing uh new new music stuff, right? Like new releases uh that kind of recommendation to kind of like drive listener attention to new things and that's been increasingly um prominent in the app and, and i have to admit like a couple times like an artist i like I, i've learned about a new album from an artist i like from spotify before i i, I like found out about it somewhere else and yeah no, i know i hear that i mean like i know i know this is like super niche and like probably not for everybody but i've the curated playlist that they've been doing since like 2013 or whatever like i used to actually pay attention to that and i don't know if that was 
No, people actually, love that. The, that the Discover actually, Weekly stuff, people yeah, love that. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, Discover Weekly. And I think that actually, I think at one point, it actually was at least partially curated by real people. Because I believe like a, somebody I worked with at Red Bull's like girlfriend did it. But like, I think I think it's like it's AI generated or algorithmically generated or whatever, however you sort of whatever the right term is. Yeah. And then like, yeah, yeah. I think it's algorithmically generated. And then like someone goes in there and like kind of like, you know, puts on the finishing touches or whatever or at least that's the way it used to be but like yeah i mean that was great i mean i know like a lot of people don't care about that kind of stuff but like still, yeah pe- pe- people still love it and so that that's i'm just saying the vertical thing might actually like from a total like, <laughs> like i don't want this podcast to be like the pot the spotify review but like i actually think that like pushing that sense of like here's recommend like pushing the recommendation in that style um might be might be effective i like i don't think it will be good <laughs> but it might work yeah yeah possibly i guess we'll just you know once again like wait and see it's um but uh you know it's always in an effort to attract more gen z listeners um anyways okay well, well we're gonna put a pin on that and we're gonna transition to what the majors think about all this because there's lots of rumblings and rumors and official statements by uh daddy lucian grange and uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, talk about that a little bit in the second half of the show. I'm so mad. My tea is decaf, dude. It's like a slap in the fucking face. Oh man. Yeah. No wonder you're not like not 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 on it this episode. Just kidding, you are. I'm just kidding. Just, just kidding, we say in podcast voice. Just kidding. You are just kid. kidding. You're great. <laughs> um so as all that stuff with Spotify has been going on, there's also been uh some rumblings, news, uh public statements by daddy. Sir Lucian Grange, uh, head of uh, UMG. You can't call him daddy, uh, Sir Lucian And with Grange. the other... <laughs> yeah, of course, he is. He's daddy, of course. Um, so, daddy said that music needs a new streaming payout model, and we're working on it. But what does uh, Lucian Grange, Sir Lucian Grange, actually fucking mean by that? Mm. Well, he's got a lot of complaints, and he's got some places. He got some things. He's got, and he has some things in in, in his crosshairs, but uh, but the alternative to uh, the need for a new streaming payout model is is still uh, still a little murky. But let, let's 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 start with uh, what 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 uh, Lucian Grange is saying and uh, try to try to try to parse it out and see see what the what the complaints are and uh, where we think him and the uh, the major labels might be going with this. Uh, in a in a I think it was like a, a quarterly letter to investors or something. He wrote that there is a growing disconnect between there is a growing disconnect between on the one hand the devotion of those artists whom fans value and seek to support of, and on the other hand the way subscription fees are paid by the platforms. Under the current model, the critical contri- contributions of too many artists, as well as their the engagement of too many fans, is being undervalued. And which is kind of a little bit what you were kind of talking about maybe in the first half of the show about like maybe we just need to value music more like music's like worth like twenty dollars a month but obviously daddy has different uh concerns that you and i do on this show so like let's kind of parse out like what sir lucian grange is like trying to trying to say here so like there's a lot there's a lot going on there's a lot going on here and in some ways i think it's it's kind of remarkable, right? Because it's it's a it's a really fascinating naked power flex from an attempted power flex from the majors who are trying to use their position within the broader music economy, within the streaming economy, to kind of uh, reshape 
the world of streaming or threatening to reshape the world of streaming as a whole set of other actors in this ecosystem. And this ecosystem, by the way, that <laughs> the major set up as these other actors have found ways to create increasingly profitable niches in that ecosystem and are now threatening to challenge the majors in certain ways. And this is the majors basically saying, we built this thing. We'll tear it down if we have to. And the power is with us, not with the streaming ecosystem as it's currently constituted. And don't get it twisted. Okay. I, just a side note, like I find that pretty fascinating because it because it, just the fact that they feel the need to, or that you know Lucian Grange or others like feel the need to like come out and like kind of like establish that, already makes me feel like they must be worried about something. I think they are. I think they're worried about TikTok. <laughs> I think yeah. I think I think they are worried. I think they're worried about a couple of different things, and I think more than them being worried about the present i think that they're worried about the future and i think they're worried because well, a lot of different reasons it's wonderful book a lot of reasons but there's this wonderful book called um fortune's fool that we've talked about a couple times um it's about edgar bromfman who is the seagram's, seagram's heir yep. who sets up universal music and canadian <laughs> club baby Basically, that they're they're looking at the music industry in like the late '90s, and they're making a lot of money, and they're looking ahead and being like, "We need to get really, really big, or we're gonna get swallowed by AOL." And I mean, the story of the music industry is that they they really biffed that transition um, because nailing the timing on these things is hard, but in many ways. Bronfman was right, and that Universal Music's massive success has, has been a validation of that strategy. And I, and I think that the music industry and the major labels realize that they're on the precipice of a series of major, like, technological and, and techno-social changes, of which I would say, like, TikTok is an indicator and is, like, is not the full story, but is a taste of what's coming, maybe, as music increasingly becomes an integral, commodified music becomes an integral part of social media, that there's the way that people interact with each other and the ways that, that like changes changes things again. And so kind of the way that Bromfin was like, yo, guys, we got to buy up <laughs> half of the major labels and bring them together or we're not going to be in a position to profit from what comes next. I think that the majors are starting to think through that kind of stuff. But that's like in some ways uh, a little bit ancillary to to also a set of like very contemporaneous concerns. Uh, by which I mean like I read this as like the majors being like we need to get our ducks in a row at home, like in the modern streaming system, in the modern streaming economy, so that we are in a position to deal with what comes next. This feels like house cleaning is like a massive understatement, but like, uh, yeah, getting 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 their their ducks in the row in their home. Too. Yeah, and I mean, I think there's like a few like worrying signs that have kind of led to that. I mean, uh, yeah, you know, and I mean, I don't know where you so want to talk about them. Yeah, I mean, I don't know where you want to start, but I mean, like one of them is this sort of thing that like Grange outlined, which was like fraudulent actors and like fake artists i guess is the way you can put it where basically uh there's like stream farms and other like sort of illicit methods to generate billions of like fake streams that like obviously suck royalties away from legitimate artists but then also the sort of like ai generated music uh which we've like also discussed um and which like streaming services like spotify have even commissioned you know in order to uh clog up a mood setting playlist or or what or whatever so th those are definitely like some some other things uh some of the things i that mean they're worried the about stream yo the stream farm thing the stream farm thing look i have like <laughs> full disclaimer i have no proof right but i'm calling false flag on this yeah like totally. yes stream farms can be used to bolster 
artists that aren't on the major labels but if you're gonna try to look me in my eyes and tell me (laughs) that no artists on a major label have ever benefited from artificially inflated streaming numbers i'm gonna look you in your eyes and tell you that you're a fool if not worse to to me that's 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 a big like not misdirection exactly but like (laughs) he <laughs> doth complain too much you know i don't know it's maybe like trying to like build a straw mode up so so they can go ahead and knock yeah, it down knock it down yeah. yeah exactly yeah yeah for sure for sure yeah absolutely i mean i think um for me the statistic that i'm, I'm most interested in is the declining percentage oh yeah this is good yeah I was, I was about to get to that but go ahead major labels the three majors uh warner sony and umg universal music group plus merlin which is like the big consolidated air quotes independent label organization the three of them have over the past uh like four or five years um gone from 87 percent of streams on spotify which is by the way an insane percentage um down to the still very high 77 percent and while like 77% is still a lot of the percentage of total streams to be controlled by three companies plus Merlin. It's so 87 to 77 is a real, is a real decline. And another way to illustrate that decline is that there's also been, if I could just shoehorn this in here, another decreasing amount of like superstar producing money for labels through the streaming where in 2012, like the top five artists, uh, we're generating like fifteen percent of like yeah for Warner Music Group like, yeah yeah for Warner Music Group and now like they're only generating like five percent which is just like another sort of aspect to sort of illustrate uh, this this issue I guess for for the majors and and the final the final like a statistic in um <laughs> our little statistical interlude is that there's like a hundred thousand pieces of music uploaded every day which what, what was the stat did you a hundred what was that stat? Did you hear that stat that it was like something like i think it was either was it in a day or was it in like the amount of music uploaded in a year it would take you something like five like 627 years to like listen to it all or something <laughs> it like, sounds i mean uh, my predict my my prediction like 10 years ago like which was just like there's gonna be like a content overload here like has like definitely like continued not that that was like some great insight but like holy shit like (laughs) yeah and so and so like given all of that right and and again the the good people at music business worldwide did some some nice analysis of this and saying that like yeah sure the vast majority of those artists have like no plays no play like literally literally no no plays plays. yeah yeah (laughs) like yeah but streams but if there's enough of them if there's enough of them like in the aggregate they start really reshaping the you know putting pressure reshaping the streaming market right like that's you know you, you're paying you know only 22 cents to all of them but like they start like that's a big chunk of things but if you let's say for instance i don't know move to streaming service to something more like a discovery based tiktok interface with a vertical scroll you know i don't know something crazy like that and like you know started really pushing people towards all kinds of music based on that kind of algorithmic discovery model like i you could see that percentage potentially increasing substantively which could then in turn allow i don't know (laughs) a company like spotify to go to the majors and say like look we need to renegotiate these deals because when we negotiated them the first time you were making 87 percent of the you were responsible for 87 percent of the total streams in this platform and now you're down to i don't know i mean 77 recently but like you know you're down to let's say they do this and there's a major drop you're down to 70 percent and that's a 17 that's almost a 20 percent decrease in the number of streams that you're responsible for out of the total number and like the money's going to work differently. And given how much money the majors have made off of not just the pass-through, but like the other kinds of negotiations that um, and benefits that they get from their leverage over these companies, that's uh, 
that's potentially a real threat, I think. Yeah, I mean, maybe that'd be the kind of the great revolution. I mean, maybe that's the sort of like the great revolution of like TikTok when it comes in regards to music is that like these mis- this mysterious algorithm, which is like kind of like making uh, mid level tier indie stars uh, through this vertical swiped uh, method, is going to be the great disruptor. Who knows? Yeah, no, totally, totally. And it's unclear, right? TikTok is is doing its own set of things. They, there's this really interesting story. I don't know if you saw it, Saxon, about they tested in Australia. Yeah, they're like, fuck the Aussies. <laughs> they stripping all major label music from like a subsection of users in Australia, um, which means that this, the music that was previously underneath the audio is now just gone. <laughs> so it's just like some like poor you know, outback like kangaroo video. farmer could like no longer listen to midnight oil is basically what happened yeah or no rather like make a tiktok with midnight oil in it yeah um, with with the kangaroos oh yeah right gotcha or acdc <laughs> yeah i don't know why i went midnight oil but whatever <laughs> <laughs> I was ready to roll with it, but yeah, what? <laughs> like, like when I pull out like the like most like a very obscure Australian one hit wonder. But okay, anyways, yeah, anyways, you <laughs> listeners, you get the point. <laughs> like, um, no, ba- no back in black to a kangaroo like like punching kangaroo its farmer, montage. Its no, yeah. that would be kick yeah, ass yeah. actually. Um, no, but but so and though again in the secretive world of TikTok, like no word on how that test went. <laughs> like whether it negatively impacted people's enjoyment of TikTok, and you know, at, at, at behind a lot of this, at, at least behind the fight with Spotify, and this kind of goes to to what I said about Sir Lucian Grange's uh, statement, saying kind of we built this system and we will change it if we want to, is the thing behind this system is this like artificial idea of a stream and how it's valued and this is like this two almost like a two-tiered construct that really isn't that old a construct um right this idea that a there's the pro rata streaming system which is basically a very complicated system saying kind of like there's a certain amount of money that goes in to a big pot That is then a big pot that is then split up into percentages where each artist is paid out in relationship to their percentage of streams within the total streams weighted in some ways by like whether or not the people streaming it are um, paying subscriptions or not. All of which is very complicated, but basically means that instead of artists being paid by the stream where like you streaming an artist has a direct contribution you kind of get thrown into your listens get thrown into a big pot which is then determined by the overall ratios of that pot so and when 87 percent of like what people are listening to is like uh under contract at a major label or merlin that's great but then when you see that 87 percent go down 10 percent within a 10-year period you go "Mm, this is a very worrying trend Right, and in some ways, it like it pits these artists against each other, and that like you listening to the Spice Girls actively impacts how much money my beloved Bewitched are paid, <laughs> and so these artists are being pitted against each other in the pro rata system, which like yeah, as you're saying, means that the overall ratios that this massive unending river of artists being paid thirty five cents, which by the way, check the Music Modernization Act. Check our recent episode with the wonderful Daniel Robinson about rights fraud. If the person who has the stream that makes the, the, the person that has the artist that gets 35 streams has their payouts set up right, then they'll get paid 20 cents. But like, I've got, like, my high school band or, like, right post-college band is on Spotify somewhere. And I would guess that we have 300 plays. Maybe. Maybe. But, like, that means I'm entitled to a whopping, like, eight cents (laughs) split three ways. But, like, multiply that by, like, 35,000 and you've got almost a dollar. 
and <laughs> multiply that by a lot more by a hundred thousand tracks a year and like I, I wonder what percentage of the money paid out to those really, really low play people actually gets to them and how much of it is just like in an escrow account in Spotify somewhere. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe they've got detectives tracking down all of the rights holders. But yeah, I highly like, doubt it. Yeah, they given, all just got laid yeah, off. Given everything, <laughs> I highly doubt it. So yeah, and I mean, like the, the but and the, the irony of it, we have to we have to say the irony of it is that like ten years ago, like the big labels were like just fine with the pro rate system, yeah, because like, ab- well, most absolutely. of the mainstream is ours anyway, and so and, like, and now it's starting to slowly, but it's starting to become a problem. Um, right. So, so that they're saying like that's what it's kind of the the the, the, the almost like <laughs> shockingly naked power grab of it right the power play of it where they go like you're saying we set up this system it was working for us we decided that like how many times a song is played is the basic metric of music and not like any of the other metrics you can imagine like how many hours an artist is played for like you could calculate that i mean it would it'd be complicated in relationship to like certain kind of copyright laws but you could calculate it and figure out ways to do it we decided that like 30 seconds is how much it takes for um, like a full play to kick in in terms of payment stuff. A decision which, as like we've discussed before, fundamentally remade the aesthetics of popular music to the point where like most hit songs are like under two minutes long, especially in rap. And they're able to say like, "Ah, you know, we're not feeling it anymore. (laughs) We're just gonna change it. Or... Or like, can they? I guess that, and that maybe to like sort of uh, like uh, wrap this this episode up. Like, I mean, that is the question. Like, I mean, do they have the power to just fundamentally change it? And then, like, if they do decide to fundamentally change it, how will that like completely shake up? You know, streaming, listening to music, the tech industry, and so forth, and all the other various like touch points uh, that we engage with music, uh, either passively or actively um, in today's contemporary world. Um, and I, you know, and I guess it's like, and I'm sure there's like many other like possibilities and like ways in which we could like go galaxy brain and like think about like the, the endless possibilities. Um, but like that, I think is like the real question in which we're seeing all these changes, all these discussions, all these rumblings and kind of asking ourselves like what this, it seems like we're going to reach like a certain inflection point or like, this is all going to like come to a loggerheads at some point, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's. As always, like, it's important to, to like, you know, we have a couple rules on this podcast, you know, and one of them is, like, don't bet against the major labels. Don't come to any conclusions. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, yeah, that too. Yeah, yeah, that too, yeah. Um, And, like, at this point, the execs who are running these companies have made their way through, like, the, the most disrupted industry <laughs> in many ways, you know, and have managed to claw their way back to the top um, or back to profitability. And it, it is, I think, when you're saying, like, do they have the power to do this? I think that they are very aware that 2002 can never happen again. Like, there's a moment in 2002 where the major labels, like, really, where changes are just incipient and things are starting to shift And the major labels could, like, get people in the rule because they, like, still ruled the world. And that by 2004, 2005, that chance was gone. And they had to take the deals they could get and, in some ways, made disastrous decisions based on that. And so, like, there's a question of, like, threatening to play hardball now is saying we're not going to wait for another three years where maybe we can't play hardball in the same way. And so, like, right now... If if Universal doesn't re-sign a deal with Spotify, it dies. Right? I if 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 UMG is if if UMG is no longer on Spotify, if all of those artists are no longer on Spotify, like Spotify immediately is a significantly less valuable service than Apple Music. That day. Forget your discovery, forget your at least today, right? But then the, the, that, that, all, that also illustrates like like the worry as well, because on the other side, you do see Spotify and TikTok, which I mean, for all purposes are pretty different companies, like d- doing the same thing, trying to like come out from under this grip 
of these like three major labels. And so, yeah, that, that's why I say, like, I feel like it's going to come to a loggerhead oh, yeah, at some they're, point. Oh, they're, they're yeah, negotiating... you know, obviously the huge concern about AI-generated music. Yeah, and this is also the huge concern about AI-generated music. Yeah, exactly. Because, like, if that music, you know, that music doesn't fall under any kind of, like, like contract contractual obligations to any of, yeah. the, any of the major labels. It, and, and I think along those lines, I, th- I think your point about AI-generated music is a really good one, right? Which is, like, it's starting to happen. Certainly, you can use it. I mean, or... Or the, <laughs> you don't need to have AI generated music. Like this fake artist thing where Spotify just basically fills, makes these, hires people to make fake artist accounts and upload their music to Spotify, which then gets put on playlists. But Spotify like doesn't, basically like internal to Spotify library music, um, which as far as I can tell, like would be legal except that in doing so, they game the pro rata system and would make the majors mad at them. So like the only reason it's secret, it's the only reason it's fake artists and not just like a thing called Spotify sounds is because because literally <laughs> like you're taking Taylor Swift's money when you do that. <laughs> No, and then what's also interesting though, on top of that is like, you know, just, just continuing to kind of like maneuver through this big picture wise is that the more this trend continues and the weaker and the less important like the majors could possibly become, then the stronger the independent artists become and, and start to have like a say in like the direction of like where these companies are going and like how they make their money and how their music is distributed and like what platforms they want it on. Well, and that's what kind of brings me to like one of the, the 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 interesting points in at least the way that these very early moves, like this this early like posturing, is 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 going down, and that if you read what Lucian Grange is saying, is that he's kind of raising this question that we've raised, uh, <laughs> pat on the back, Saxon, um, that we've raised a bunch of times, which is about the value of music and the value of you know his mind like umg big umg artists to these companies um or big major label artists if you want to cast a broader net to these to these streaming companies into the streaming ecosystem overall right and basically saying that there's a difference between the streams you put on in the background and the stream, right, that, like, fill up the soundscape of modern life that we all are listen to constantly in cafes. And there's the passive listening that we've all become so inured to, right? That there's a difference between that and the value of, holy shit, Beyonce just dropped a new album and I need to go listen to it right now, right? And that he argues... Uh, and they, I think the majors are, are going to be arguing that that second category of like really active fan driven listening um, that people really care about, something that resembles in many ways like the older school of music listening, right? Like a mid 20th century model of music listening, that the value of that music listening is not being adequately captured in the pro rata streaming model. And that that value actually powers the value of all those other tracks, right? That the reason that you're even on Spotify listening to fake artist Spotify sounds is because two weeks before Beyonce dropped an album and you listened to Spotify, right? And that's why you have a Spotify subscription. And that's, you know, that's why you pay your $10 a month or maybe in the future $12 a month or $15 a month. And that streaming should reflect that and that's like a at one level a really convenient art argument for them to develop now but what i'm interested in i think is almost like less whether the argument is right or not because in, in, in some ways i think it is and in some ways i think that like it would be really interesting to be able to know what happened in that tiktok study is my bet that for at least some of these services as things change like like generic EDM house AI house banger will work just fine for a lot of TikTok videos. I'm also really interested in like the strategic or not strategic really, like the the tactical potential of this argument for artists. And maybe like that's a good 
I'd like to hear your your take on this, Saxon, and maybe maybe it's a nice way to like close out this conversation because it seems like that argument about the value of specific the idea that all streams are not created equal right that certain kind of musical interactions are more valuable than other kinds of musical interactions and that certain kinds of musical interactions you know mediated via the streaming services actually power this broader musical ecosystem that seems like an argument that a lot of these artist groups could really get behind and that could actually like serve them really well as they claim a bigger slice of the pie. I think that's already been made. That's, that's, that's basically suggesting that like, you know, if we pulled, if we pulled Beyonce, it would like from like your streaming service, it would like kill like the streaming service. And so therefore like it should be compensated more valuably. Yeah. Yeah. But, but then it's also saying something else, right? It's saying that, the way that you can understand the value of Beyonce is not entirely contained in the quantitative analysis of how many streams Beyonce has, right? It's It says that the value of Beyonce to the music streaming ecosystem is about her broader cultural relevance, her broader importance, how engaged her listeners are. And like, I feel like that's an argument that you could also make about a lot of smaller artists, that a lot of smaller artists whose fans I mean it's just so complicated it's I mean I think whose fans are really passionate and and like <laughs> because it's also like weird because if you think about it like so much of like the like like so much of that is like also like algorithmically generated like like fandom is now you know and so <clears throat> you're getting these completely independent artists who suddenly are getting like semi you know middle middle tier famous or at least enough to like support like a sold out show at like a smaller you know 500 person venue because like a tiktok video like using their music like blew up right and that doesn't make mean that like their fans are any less of fans than like beyonce but the difference is that beyonce has this whole music industry and team behind her that's like creating that sort of fandom and it's working like obviously it's like two-way street but it's like yeah it's her music but it's also like d- deep pockets like the deep pockets of like a whole creative like uh team that's being funded by the like whatever label she's on and, and management company and everything right opposed to like some random country singer getting like semi big in like off of like a algorithmically generated like TikTok video that someone made using that song in like, you know, the North Georgia mountains. Like, you know, it's different, right? It's different. But for the major so I mean I don't I don't really know how to answer your question, but like the the difference is that like the labels are using that argument because of the fact that like they're putting money behind this and they know how important like Beyonce is to Spotify. But what we are seeing is that we are seeing, I think that trend changing, right? Where you're getting fans generating content, which then creates a like bigger fandom, but by using the tool of like the TikTok algorithm. Right. And so I don't like, it's, it's like a hard, it's a hard question. And like, I feel like it's something that we could kind of like talk about, like, for like a long period of time but i'm curious like why do you think that that's like why why do you think that's something that like these like like that like other artists could get behind i guess i think that because in some ways I, i feel like it's a more holistic argument about what the music economy looks like and that a more holistic vision of what the music economy looks like where you're taking into account like how intense fans are and how you know, how much musical energy they generate you know, or economic energy they generate by like going to shows and, and that kind of stuff. I mean, in some ways it looks a little bit more like potentially like a model that, that values artists based on like the kinds of um, long term that, that values artists music as, you know, music as music, music, the commodity music um, in, in a way that maybe looks a little bit more like the older record label model which as we know i think did did better for like not all artists but did better for a lot of like low to mid level artists and that the pro rata system has not worked for them very well at all and that a a version where like you could have a whole bunch of really engaged fans consistently listening to your record and if you could do that and make more money via a streaming system like because there's a, a a a vision of music valuation that 
bumps things more in the direction of, of valuing that set of holistic uh, social relationships around music. I mean, I think that that's something that as, it's, it's at least worth a try. No, yeah, 100%. I, and there's two sides of that coin, right? Like, I could see that. Obviously, the prorated system isn't, like, helping, like, the indies or whatever. Just a big, broad air quotes there. But, like, also... Like, it's funny because that same argument could also be used for uh, what I'm saying is that that same argument could also be used for the majors to be like, if we strip you of Beyonce and Kendrick Lamar, then like your f- streaming service goes to hell. Um, no, totally. And and I guess what I'm saying is that it seems like this is a space where cl- it's clear what the majors want out of this argument. But I wonder whether like. You know, you know those that that funny argumentative tactic where like so you say something and someone like starts agreeing with you too hard and then they just like take your point and take it in another direction. <laughs> like I think that there's like a there's a possibility of being able to do that. Of being able to be like, yeah, the major labels are definitely totally right about this. And in fact, <laughs> they should go even further in like valuing these other metrics in, in terms of streams. And they should totally get rid of the pro rata system and all that. Yeah, interesting, interesting, interesting. Well, we've already gone plenty long on this episode. And uh, we will leave you with many questions and things to think about. And yeah, I guess we'll kind of see what will happen and like whether or we'll not keep watching the space keep watching that space as usual um as you uh music by burn language please rate and review us follow us on all the socials and subscribe to our newsletter we'll see you in a few weeks thanks for listening bye